Hi. If you're here, then you probably already know what Five Nights at Freddy's is, and how it's a hit with teens and young adults, or maybe you don't. But people keep talking about it, and you're curious why. Perhaps it annoys you that so many people praise this franchise, which you don't even consider to be all that scary, but people seem to adore for some reason. Or maybe you have a child who asks you for a Foxy-themed birthday party, and you have no idea what that means, but you're curious about their interests. Or maybe you're just here for the memes. And to be honest, I don't blame you. There, there's the some Freddy good memes. Seven. Regardless of the reasoning, you're here because Five Nights at Freddy's has skyrocketed in popularity over the past decade, to a degree which you don't see with many other franchises. And if this is your first time hearing about it, then hi. Welcome. Feel free to take a seat. I'm Stormy. Don't worry about the anime girl on screen. It's all in your head. And lastly... I'm a Five Nights at Freddy's fan. I've known about these games since the first one came out, and I followed it really closely through all 9 mainline entries, 23 books, and various spin-offs and fan games. Needless to say, I like this franchise a lot, and it took me a long time to explain why. Sometimes that's the hardest thing you can do, is just explain why you feel the way you do about something. If you're on this video, you probably already know what Five Nights at Freddy's is. A horror game about haunted animatronics and the ghost children possessing them. Seems simple on the surface, right? Anybody who's a fan of this franchise would probably tell you that the lore is super interesting, or the characters are really fun, but that's not really addressing the question. I could say that about a number of other games that don't have nearly the same traction that Five Nights at Freddy's, or FNAF, has. In the time I've spent in this community, I don't think I've seen anyone succinctly explain why it's so beloved. And I don't mean how Scott Cawthon, the creator, managed to find success in a last-ditch effort to make a career out of game development, or why so many people find entertainment in a fictional Chuck E. Cheese parody with some lavender-colored gentleman and a boy named Gregory who needs to vent to be sus. No, essentially I'm not here to talk about why FNAF is beloved. I'm here to talk about why it's so beloved. Why fans will sit down for literally hours to talk to anybody who will listen to a 12-page dissertation on why the main villain isn't a walking corpse, but is in fact a rogue artificial intelligence. Why any sane person would unironically throw on a playlist in the car about a song about murdering children. That's actually an easier answer, just listen to it, it's a banger. Why the fanbase produces fan art that is so fantastic, and also fan art that's really interesting. And just generally, why do people love it so much? I became familiar with this franchise shortly after the first game came out. I wasn't a fan, per se, but I did know of the game. In fact, I have a very specific memory of watching Markiplier's playthrough in the middle of my computer programming class in high school. The teacher did not give a single care in the world, he just kind of let us do whatever. But that moment ties into exactly how Five Nights at Freddy's grabbed the attention of so many people to begin with. Let's Players. A Let's Player is a term for people online who post videos of themselves playing things, usually video games. Suddenly, if you were bored, you always had something new to watch every day. If you couldn't afford to buy games or a fancy computer to play them on, you could be sure that somebody in their early to mid-twenties with a microphone and some free time would probably have a series on their channel playing through it, usually with commentary to get acquainted with who you were watching. In addition to that, though, came exposure to new franchises, most popular among them for the time being horror games. Amnesia, Slender, any amount of creepy indie projects by budding developers, which is really attractive to younger people who have some investment in the gaming scene. And that might seem like a given nowadays. Let's players are everywhere now, so are new indie games. But in 2014, this was brand new territory. Not just Let's Players, but the act of watching someone online get scared at video games as a pastime. Now, you don't have to be alone to experience the horror genre. And you didn't need friends in the same space, either. They could watch someone else get scared for them, and become used to it, want to explore more of it. Because let's be honest, if something isn't for kids, like most horror games, then those kids will want to know more. You can't really hide stuff like that from them forever. The reason I have to bring all this up, though, is because the virality of these videos and the people making them is closely linked to FNAF's success. When FNAF started to gain popularity around 2014, so were Let's Players. The difference with Five Nights at Freddy's, though, is that it's aimed at making horror as approachable for anyone as possible. While characters like Freddy Krueger and Michael Myers used to be household names in the 80s and early 90s, the horror scene had somewhat diminished by the 2010s. It wasn't very approachable, and the lack of quality sequels definitely had something to do with that. But FNAF was different. While on the surface this game might seem like a cheap attempt at jump scare horror, it really did revolutionize how developers would approach scares in a video game format. If you were good enough, you could avoid all jump scares entirely. The disturbing imagery is extremely mild compared to many other franchises, but can still give you a jump in the heart rate here and there. There's no gore. There's no extreme violence. In fact, these characters are pretty damn cuddly. 
Whether Scott Cawthon knew it at the time, the bright colors and easily identifiable silhouettes make these characters incredibly iconic, same as the cartoon mascots they're inspired by. And if all that makes it sound like this is a franchise for children and teens who have never seen a horror movie in their life, then yeah, you might be right. But it goes a lot deeper than that. Because at the end of the day, Five Nights at Freddy's is an entry point for people looking to get into the horror genre. FNAF aims to hit a balance of scary content and iconic marketable characters. Because if I'm being honest, on the surface, Five Nights at Freddy's does attract a certain type of age group. That being those of a younger demographic, with a clamoring for merch. Plushies, t-shirts, you name it. And that's not to say that merch like this is specifically for kids. It's for everyone. I have a couple of plushies sitting on my bed right now. This Fredbear one is my favorite. The colorful characters just really lend themselves to having merch made. It's kind of perfect for that. People love these characters, kids and adults alike. Not just their designs, but their personalities as well. This, combined with the social interaction outlet that Let's Players provide, make FNAF really attractive to a younger audience who just adore these cuddly characters and want to share that experience with others. But you might be confused at that. I thought this was supposed to be a horror franchise, you might be asking. How can cuddly characters like Pillow Pet Freddy? How can cuddly characters like Bonnie the Bunny and Chica the Chicken really invoke fear? If kids like them, then how can they experience fear through horror? These things aren't scary. They're not that bad. Connection terminated. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth. If you still even remember that name. It's only now that I understand the depth of the depravity of this creature, this monster that I unwillingly helped to create. And I found her. I put her back together. Just like you asked me to. She's free now. This place will not be remembered, and the memory of everything that started this can finally begin to fade away, as the agony of every tragedy should. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still, and give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. For most of you, I believe there is peace, and perhaps more, waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, friend. Sometimes the fear we feel in something isn't in just how it's presented to us. Fear is subjective, of course, but it also depends on your own experiences. And when you've grown up as a person, realize the tragedy behind things you used to find cute or fun, or even stop for a moment to immerse yourself in what's really going on, that can be enough for some people. For most children, they'll buy a Freddy pillow pet and run off and be happy with that. But FNAF is built on multiple pillars. Pillars that are the main reasons fans get invested in the franchise. We talked about one already, which are the characters. But another... Oh god. Oh god, he's here! Oh god! Oh no! I became familiar with this franchise in 2015, shortly after Five Nights at Freddy's 4 came out. I wasn't a fan, like those kids per se, but I did know of the lore a little bit. In fact, I have very specific memories of watching MatPat's livestream where they were trying to solve the lore finally. It didn't end up happening. I was in college in my dorm room and my roommate wasn't going to come back for a while so I just cranked it up to full volume and was sitting there, theorizing with everyone else. I didn't play the games and I definitely didn't draw fan art. I don't want to be considered a super fan of this series with a cringy fan base, but the story was interesting, so I stuck around for that. And that moment ties into exactly how FNAF grabbed the attention of so many people to begin with. Those monologues and cutscenes from a minute ago do have context, and that context is some of the most interesting storytelling I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing. And it's confusing, because playing through these games normally doesn't paint the bigger picture. Lore has become something of a meme as of late. If you're a nerd who likes talking about your favorite franchise, then lore can be a way to have extra knowledge you can bore people at parties with. Like me. But for Five Nights at Freddy's, its entire story is the lore. If you're familiar with this franchise, then you'll know how obtuse it is. Playing through these games normally will be confusing, because it's not concerned with a focused narrative. Sure, you might get details like the main character being named Mike, or the Yellow Rabbit being the main villain, but there's a much larger story going on here. A story of business partners and lost friendships. A story of brothers and regrets of the past. Soul energy and eternal life. Small ghosts trying to achieve their final, happiest day. Let's say you've just played the latest FNAF game. You thought it was great, but have no idea what happened or why you just sat there for hours roaming a giant pizza plex. You haven't played any of these games since the first one, but you want to know what you missed. So you go to YouTube, type in Five Nights at Freddy's Story Explained, and are greeted with hundreds. 
of videos, hours of explanations, all of them their own unique interpretations alongside a barrage of theories. Now you have theory videos plaguing your recommendeds. Oh, a video on William Afton? Who even is he? The movie didn't go into much detail on him. Sure, I was always confused about the puppet. What's her deal? What happened to Cassie at the end of this DLC? I need to know what happened to my child. A video on Scrap Shop that explains why he looks what oh, this guy's a VTuber. Never mind, cringe. But hey, that MatPat guy keeps popping up and seems to know a lot. Let me watch all 58 of his FNAF videos in order to understand the bigger picture of this franchise. Then maybe I'll have time for the nine hour long lore explanation. Do you see how much of a rabbit hole this can be? It's almost like a symbiotic relationship. The videos give the games more attention and the games give YouTube channels more recognition because people are passionate about piecing together this story. And on top of that, the story is made for the fans. It's constructed in a way to serve as a brain teaser even for people who are intimately familiar with all of its details. Few details are ever concrete, and that's why the theories exist. The details leave you wondering why else would that be there if not to remind you of that one part in another game. It feels very intentional. There are plot threads that seemingly end, but are then strung along like there's a bigger mystery to be solved, similar to how detective shows will set up a mystery for the audience to solve before revealing it at the end. Five Nights at Freddy's sets up a mystery for you to solve, or like I mentioned earlier, to look up how other people solved it on YouTube. And that right there is exactly how it draws people in even further. Entire communities exist specifically because we like piecing together the unexplained, and it sticks in our minds because those unanswered questions will always linger for us. This actually follows something called the Zygernik effect, which is a psychological tendency studied by Bluma Zygernik in 1927. Bluma noticed that waiters would remember an order only until it was fulfilled and brought to the customer, after which they would forget what the order was entirely. She proposed that humans remember unfinished tasks much more clearly than finished ones. Which makes sense. If all answers to a story are provided, it might be 100% satisfying, sure, but we'd stop thinking about it there'd be nothing left to discuss. By the way, yes, I did look all that up, and yes, this is the most research I've done outside of a school paper. So what if I've got hobbies? Fucking sue me. FNAF does an incredible job of leaving enough plot threads open to interpretation that will never be truly over or solved. It's designed that way. Scott knows this, and even acknowledges it. That might seem sadistic on his part, but it's for a purpose. Small spoiler warning for the first few minutes of the recent movie. If you've seen it, you may remember how Mike shows a book titled Dream Theory to the character on screen now. Dream Theory was a very popular idea back in the day that the original games were all in the dream of a child. Later games wouldn't follow the story idea, but it was the catalyst for Scott to recognize just how passionate and special having an open plot like this is. This character asks Mike if people really believe this stuff, and Mike goes on to say, some people do. I guess it just depends on what you believe. Yeah, okay, Scott, you cheeky. Five Nights at Freddy's is a story unlike many others in mainstream media. It's up to the audience to decide what it all means. It's a collaborative effort. It's why there's a locked box containing answers which will never be opened. At least not by Scott. In his own words, the fact that the pieces have remained elusive this time strikes me as incredible and special, a fitting conclusion in some ways. And because of that, I've decided that maybe some things are best left forgotten forever. It's to leave room for creators and fans to keep talking about their favorite series for a long time. And there's a surreal beauty in that. It's easy to make a story that ends. It's also easy to make a story that goes absolutely nowhere. But it is hard to make a mystery that feels solvable while leaving the final reveal entirely up to the audience. Even if you're not here for the jump scares or the gameplay, the story will leave people thinking about it for a long, long time. And when discussion happens, opinions are formed, ideas are had. Not just by yourself, but by a slew of some of the most creative people in any fandom ever. And those people are often both the best, and sometimes the scariest part of any franchise this big. I became familiar with this franchise in 2019, shortly after Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted came out. I didn't really have my life together back then, I didn't know how to handle a lot of my mental. But hey. FNAF was there. For every theory I watched, it felt like being that much closer to everything making sense, right? I could figure that out, at least. If life didn't make sense, at least FNAF eventually would, right? I didn't know why I felt the way I did about life. I couldn't really explain my thoughts to others. And that would have been fine if I even had the time to explain why I couldn't keep up with it all. The community behind Five Nights at Freddy's has had a bit of a rough history, let's put it that way. Between people who don't deserve to have a platform to speak on, and even some questionable actions by the people in charge, there have been some rough patches. 
And the FNAF fandom has definitely appeared to be that kind of fandom in the past. You know the one. Questionable fan art and overly uh, passionate fans have given the community a bad name on occasion. But then, don't those things exist in every fandom? That's not an excuse for these things to exist. As a collective group of people, it's the responsibility of everyone to ensure that the bad eggs are reined in. So you should always judge a community by the quality and quantity of the ones willing to do good. And this one has done a pretty good job of it. This community is strong, really strong. Seriously, they make other fandoms look small by comparison to how passionate the people are here. Animations, art, music. There's a slew of creations made by people who genuinely have a love for these characters and this story. If you haven't kept up with it in the past nine years, it's a far cry from the community of youngins posting drawings of their favorite ships. It still exists, don't get me wrong, but hey, if a couple kids want to gush over Glamrock, Bonnie, and Freddy being close friends, fine. As long as it doesn't hurt others, let them be happy. At least those ones are just robots. <laughs> she is such a bad though! I want to give her a respectful amount of distance, right? That's what you want. Those kids from 2014 have had a lot of time to grow up, learn new things, be exposed to other media, and incorporate that media into their art. Nine years is a long time for that to happen. These characters appeal to a younger audience especially, but Five Nights at Freddy's is still a horror franchise just based on premise. That may not be apparent in official material anymore, but that's because as you grow, things stop scaring you. You become bored with official media, and some have had the idea of... What if FNAF still scared me? Finally, make the torso beep and lift it upward until it is completely removed. Climb inside the torso and accept your d- FNAF VHS is a rabbit hole of analog horror that I highly encourage experiencing if you're a fan of being scared. It satisfies an itch that older members of the community might have, a longing for the days when they'd curl up in their bed afraid of Bonnie peeking out of the closet. There are multiple series in this style created by different creators with a passion for horror. Nostalgia is a powerful thing, and so is fear. Combined, they create a roller coaster of emotions that I still have not recovered from, personally. Sometimes they even highlight the incredible story set in motion by the games themselves. Nostalgia, too, is such a powerful feeling that it can be the sole reason people stick around. Music is closely tied with nostalgic feelings, activating similar levels of dopamine, and the plethora of music people have created around those memories is a perfect recipe to remind you of the positive times. Times when you would find new people in a community of them who all share the same interests. Sometimes, just the ability to share an experience like that with someone, anyone, is all you need. This community has so many people in it with positive memories of this franchise. They're passionate about it. It's why the recent movie was made pretty much exclusively with the fans in mind. Because they will come out in droves to meme on a funny bunny man getting killed over and over for as long as you ask them to. The ability to share that experience is something I think we take for granted. And being able to communicate about those memories, those feelings with others, is really special. I became familiar with myself in 2021, shortly after Five Nights at Freddy's security breach came out. I wasn't a very kind person to others. I was angry and confused, and I didn't know why. Nor could I even explain my feelings to anyone. One thing I did know was that I was lonely. Eventually, I found some people online that I really clicked with. Them and a couple others in my life were such close friends that they were genuinely interested in what I had to say, even if I didn't know how to say it. So I started small with talking about games I was interested in. There's something about having a strong interest in anything that talking about it forces you to organize your own thoughts, figure out how your own brain works, even if you're just talking about a silly animatronic horror game. And at the same time, you get to hear others' experiences understand how they feel about the same topics, see other perspectives on life, see how they deal with problems, with fear, see what they do, what they create, and having someone, anyone, who just gave me the time to gather my thoughts and just talk was exactly what I needed. I didn't know how to get it out of my system, and it took me a long time to figure out how. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do, is explain why you feel the way you do about something. Thank you for watching. This video is fairly different from my others, so let me know what you think of this format. I have theory ideas still, but I'd like to experiment once in a while too. I appreciate all of you.
and I hope you have a fantastic day.